Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank Amity University, the Amity Institute of Psychology and Allied Sciences, Amity Institute of Behavioral Health and Applied Sciences, uh, and especially Professor Abba Singh for inviting me. I wish to acknowledge the uh, Times Foundation and Chairman Indu Jain for their support of this, and especially Mr. Puran Pandey, who has become a close personal friend and an inspiration as a tireless servant to society. I'm going to be talking with you about mind-body medicine, which really is a part of psychology as well as directly a part of medicine. And I also want to say, as part of uh, Professor Singh's emphasis on positive psychology, that this is a wonderful time to be alive. This is a wonderful time to be a student receiving an education. It is a wonderful time uh, to be a psychologist. And you will see during your lifetime that the world will change dramatically and for the good. You will see that we will be entering a new age, I'd say a golden age of spirituality and a lot of the problems that we have dealt with for a long time are going to be going away. Uh, I think I will begin a little bit here talking about mind-body medicine. Uh, and we'll just be able to skip that slide, I think, in a moment here. Oh, I heard a yes. That may sound like something's beginning to work. You know, you have to be able to laugh and relax and just go with the flow on things. I do believe that's part of good mental health. Yeah. Mind-body medicine, first of all, is something that uh, the patient uh, does for themselves. That's one of the things that distinguishes this field. Uh, it is primarily done by you, whether you're the patient or whether you're simply living out in society. The applications of this field into your life are powerful. Uh, it is uh, a dynamic, holistic, and purposeful way of living. Uh, what it does is it takes into account uh, that seamless interplay of mind, body, and soul. And it leads one to a lifestyle of balance and of harmony. Uh, it leads you also into the pursuit of enlightened awareness. Now, when one speaks in such lofty terms often, that is often a an introduction to a topic that perhaps floats away from reality a little too much and may not deliver enough at the practical level. And I wish to assure you that that is exactly the opposite in this case. Uh, the methods that I will be describing to you that you will have access to are extremely powerful and you will see one of them you will walk away with today, uh, but you will also have access uh, to my website, which has all of these methods as downloads uh, that you will be able to simply sit back and listen to. And I hope to challenge you greatly, and I hope to help you improve your life substantially uh, through methods that are extremely strong. In my clinic, in Washington, D.C., we not only treat uh, mental health problems directly, depression, anxiety, the full range of issues you might see, but also as a primary treatment source of physical health care problems. So I treat a lot of people for cancer, heart disease, serious respiratory illness, 
uh, stroke. And a lot of times the people come to me and have been given a terminal diagnosis. Yet two out of three of these people from these methods uh, recover fully and go on to live a long and productive life. Uh, the methods are extremely strong. Uh, they're getting close. Now, yes, I'm just going to go forward. Uh, an essential premise of mind-body medicine is the onset and etiology of disease uh, does not blindly follow the laws of biochemistry. It follows the dictates of the soul. Now think of that a moment. That might be a less radical statement here in India. In the United States, people gasp and take in a breath. Because when it boils down to it, what is the purpose of life? It is not simply to survive. You, know, you could live, I, well, there are turtles that live for hundreds of years. And yet, perhaps they are not more evolved or advanced than we are. It is not just to stay alive. We survive for the opportunity to evolve and grow into oneness with the divine. And so if you watch, I've watched this over the years. It's been fascinating to me. Uh, when you're treating a serious health care uh, problem, it might be cancer, for example, but it also could be a debilitating form of depression. You watch how the events unfold along the way in treatment. They are not designed primarily for survival. They are not designed even for the regaining of health, though that is obviously desirable along the way. The events unfold in order to maximize our learning of the lessons in life that bring us into soul awareness and bring us into oneness with God. So this is essential. We come to learn lessons. We do not come simply to live, uh, prosper. Uh, these are good things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should die young. But we come to find God. And I think we should state that directly. And we should seek to live our lives in that way. Yes, I see. Thank you. May I have the next slide, please? Next premise. Disease in the body begins with dis-ease in the mind. Think of it for a moment. Where does the term disease come from? We don't usually reflect back on it. It starts with dis-ease in the mind. Distorted thoughts, feelings, and expectations, if allowed to go unchecked, will eventually somatize as illness in the body. So mental health treatment, partly yes, so that we are happy and fulfilled, prosperous, well-being, but also beyond that. If we don't get it at the level of mental health, it, those lessons are going to come to us at the level of our physical health. And we are going to face very challenging and serious illnesses, diseases. So let's get it first at that level, at the easier level, within our own psyche. Thank you. The genesis of disease. Unresolved mental and spiritual stress generates a negatively charged electromagnetic energy field, as measured now scientifically by fMRI uh, and MEG. Now, I'm a little older than you. I grew up in the 1960s. People talked about energy. Then, like, how do you feel? How's your energy? And it was a very loose statement. Now we are measuring energy scientifically as the basis of our biochemistry. 
we now are being able to measure thoughts and feelings as waves of electromagnetic energy that go out beyond the body. Now think of that. That's amazing when you think of it. You go through your day-to-day -day living and your different thoughts, your different feelings, you think of them as your own, private, internal. Not really so. This is what biophysics is showing us now. They emanate out beyond your body and we can measure the differences between positive and negative thoughts and feelings. They go out beyond the body and they influence events and people around you. Now, the genesis of disease. Uh, stress is what we're coming to here. Stress is not a thing that we have. It's a process, and it has three stages to it. Uh, first, where does stress come up? It comes up, obviously, in our lives, in our relationships, in our family, with our friends, in our business, uh, our academic uh, relationships with others, uh, and it's conflict and difficulties that come up. And most of the time, we can resolve these right then and there, or at least over a little bit of time, work things out, and it's fine. Uh, if not, what comes from stress? Well, the two main experienced symptoms of stress are depression and anxiety, which are so much at the under, at so much the underpinnings of major mental uh, health problems anyway, and stand in their own right as serious health care concerns. So we can then resolve these. The next step or stage is within our own psychology, either through spiritual means or psychological means. Typical example, a woman who came to me and had been through a very difficult divorce, two years later had put it behind her, was at peace with it. She said, well, he and I both did the best we could. It was all we could do she truly could let it go. So that's the second place to resolve stress and go back to ease, get rid of dis-ease. But here's where the problem comes. If stress is not resolved at one of those first two levels, the subconscious mind will somatize the negative energy symbolically in the body in the form of illness. The subconscious mind is not doing this to harm us, but rather to get us to relate authentically to our experience and what it is trying to teach us. In other words, learning the lessons that we've been avoiding so far. When we tackle a major physical health care crisis, the things that we have to learn in order to get better require us to learn a new approach to life and to go from dis-ease back to ease or peace, getting rid of the stress. So if we don't do that and this energy gets placed symbolically in the body, we call that symbolic somatization. Uh, some simple examples of this. The person who has trouble digesting the sweetness of life may very well develop diabetes. The person who remains inflexible in response to life's challenges develops arthritis. The person who chronically feels like life is one big pain in the neck, yep, develops degenerative disc disease in the cervical spine. Or sometimes with that you see people who are very busy sticking their neck out in life all over trying to accomplish things. I get that one sometimes. Now, another big one is heart disease. Ah, on we go perhaps. Yes. Oh, I like this slide. Heart disease. And I'm talking here about broken heart syndrome. In 2005, the cardiac surgeons at Johns Hopkins University Hospital wrote an article about their most difficult 
cardiac cases for surgery. What they found was uh, that these people had a bad genetic history, but also had suffered a lot of loss of love in life a lot of suffering around love, or had lived a life devoid of love. Now, how does this work then, the symbolic somatization? Think of what a heart looks like physically, then think of that image of the heart you saw on the screen a moment ago, which we associate with love and romance. The subconscious mind is placing the issues around love, all types of love, including romantic love, into the physical heart. This is a bigger cause of heart disease than all of the genetic and biological factors combined. So the role of the psychologist becomes crucial. Okay, please. Now, we get into a little bit more of what's really going on. There are four levels to the mind. The first level is conscious mind. The conscious mind consists of your everyday thoughts, feelings, perceptions. Most people are relying exclusively on this level of mind for their insight and power. But I tell you, it is the smallest and weakest part of the mind. If that's what we're going to rely on, we're in trouble. We've got to go a lot deeper than this. Each level of the mind I'm describing is accessed and we control its power through a different type of thinking. Just like a computer has an operating system, each level of mind has a different type of thinking that gives you access to it. Conscious mind, the type of thinking is logical, analytic thinking, ordinary logic and reason. The next level of mind is the subconscious mind. Now the subconscious mind is far more powerful, about three times more powerful than conscious mind. It is that level of mind that is normally outside of regular awareness. It's a storehouse of memory, thought, feeling, deep understanding. Uh, the type of, th and it can also contain our most noble hopes and dreams, the things that we most want to do with our lives, often are lodged in our subconscious mind. We struggle to find, what do I really want to do with my life? And often it is residing right in our subconscious mind, just out of sight. I'm going to show you how to get in touch with your subconscious mind along the way here. The type of thinking that allows us to access the subconscious mind is symbolic thinking. It works in terms of stories, imagery, metaphors. The next level of mind, individual superconscious mind, or what spiritual people call soul consciousness. Now, soul consciousness is capable of sensing and influencing the energy fields that create your body, that create the whole world, other people, places, things. And this level of mind is just vastly more powerful than even the subconscious mind, vastly more powerful. The type of thinking that allows us to access individual, superconscious mind, soul consciousness, is intuitive thought. We all have it at times, a deep, immediate, accurate sense of knowing something you couldn't know simply by logic. Uh, parents here know this one. You students later on will know it when your parents. Every parent has had that feeling if their child was away at school, oh no, something's wrong, my child is sick. And the vast majority of times it ends up being the case. How did you know that? You actually read that energy through that level of mind, of soul consciousness. And you can learn to master that as a skill. Then we go to uh, universal superconscious mind, what is uh, called by spiritual people divine consciousness. And this is the, uh, this is the individual superconscious mind is the portal into this. And it can be looked at through the two lenses of science or by faith. 
For the scientific point of view, we turn to the great physicists, such as the Nobel Prize winner in the 1922, I believe, Dr. Niels Bohr, uh, who showed already, some of this is not so new, back in 1920, Dr. Niels Bohr was already saying that the whole world is made out of a single universal quantum field of subatomic energy and that that whole field acts as one organized thought. That's true. So, you can look at it also from the religious or spiritual point of view. People of faith talk of this level of consciousness with all of the names of God that we have. And it's the one mind that creates and sustains everything. Pure cosmic consciousness, existence, knowledge, ever new joy. And as you know, you are that. Uh, and this level of mind uh, is accessed through meditative thought. Uh, where we melt away the distinction between world and self and the action in between and come into oneness with God. Now whether you look at this through the lens of science or the lens of, ma of uh, uh, religion, may I suggest that we look at it through both. We need a new language, a new point of view that unites both science and religion because in the end there is in fact only one mind capital letters of which we are all a part, the divine. Now, for each level of mind, there is a particular type of stress, a loss of ease that can be extremely harmful and is the underpinning of physical and psychological illness. Uh, science is shown on all of the physical illnesses uh, some studies say 50%, others are saying 70% of the cause of f serious physical illness. I'm talking cancer, heart disease, not simply minor, you catch a cold types of things. Stress. Just as I said, stress is not a thing, it's a process. It is also not simply stress, one thing. There are multiple levels to it. So conscious stress. Conscious stress arises any time that there is an unacceptable disparity between our expectations and our actual experience. This is important to think about a moment because most people think of stress simply as hardship. Not so. You can live in a society that has a great deal of hardship, but there's nowhere to go. You can't advance, you can't move forward, and you know it. So you have no expectation of getting anywhere. Well, you have no stress in that society, but you have great hardship. Let's look at some of the stressors. The classic stressors are just what you'd think, every bad thing that could ever happen to you. But I want to alert you more to contemporary stress, the stress for advancing nations. This is a problem of opportunity. Now, and you see it here in India, you now can see tremendous advance available. And people strive for it. They want it. They struggle to get it, as well they should. But that's extremely stressful. Plus, people are afraid of failure. And so the stress uh, becomes tremendous. This type of stress has decimated the United States and Japan with stress-related disease that accounts for the vast majority of disease in both countries. You can avoid this. Look what's happening now in India. You're clearly coming into being a major world power, and God bless, it should, it should have happened a long time ago. But you look and you see now, India is coming in, and India can avoid the mistakes uh, that we have made in the West and also in Japan. India has tremendous spirituality and philosophy behind it. What India has provided in spiritual wisdom to the world is a greater gift than any technology or advancement that the West could possibly bring to India. And the West is clearly in the debt of India, not the other way around. 
And what do you have? You have philosophies of non-attachment, even mindedness. When you realize that everything ultimately is maya, and you do what you do to please the divine, then you can live right, you can strive, you can move forward, but you're not attached to the outcomes. This is what we're bringing into the West thanks to you. And as I bring into you certain things scientifically uh, from the West, I'm bringing into the West the spiritual wisdom from the East. Uh, a little about myself, I come from a very traditional biomedical research family. I have the mind of a hard-nosed scientist, but I always had the heart of a spiritual seeker, of a mystic essentially. It got me in a lot of trouble when I was young with my family. They didn't approve, uh, but it led me into meditation. Uh, and for since 1968, I have meditated, God knows, three to four hours a day. And after a while, even, I don't care how poorly you meditate, as I think often my meditation was not the best, you do come into enlightened states. I've been a devotee of Paramahansa Yoganandaji, the Yogoda Satsanga Society since 1975 and been blessed by my guru uh, to come in daily into these states of uh, Sabhakalpa Samadhi, Bhava Mukta. I aspire to Nirvakalpa. We'll see. We'll see. But well, I bring in then this spiritual wisdom that comes from India, my true home, back to the West. So I'm a bit of a bridge back and forth between these two things. Now, let's go on to the next level of stress, subconscious stress. This is a bit, each level, it's a little bit worse than the one before. That's the historical stress that remains unresolved in us, and certain things, certain types of issues that we never can quite work out and keep haunting us. Uh, and these issues, maybe it's low self-esteem, we're struggling in the world, we're doing very well objectively, yet we got messages as we were growing up that we weren't worthy enough, we couldn't quite get the approval of our father or our mother, and we're always doing better and better to achieve, and yet we never feel good enough about ourselves. That's one of those unresolved issues that many people have. Well, something like that over time causes a sustained distortion in our thinking and in our feeling. And what it does is it keeps kicking in the human stress response. So it's called the fight or flight response, where we are pumping out all of these chemicals in our body, adrenaline, norepinephrine, uh, cortisol, uh, to be able to either fight because there's a challenge or run away. Our body is uh, functioning at a level of society about 10,000 years ago, uh, and so we don't have the tiger chasing us all the time anymore. Most of our stresses now uh, come from living in society, and they've become chronic. Uh, and so we are extremely sensitive to stress. Any student knows this. One of the things, I see the energies, I feel the energies, uh, and I get guidance from the next level up of our teachers that help us along. So I don't have to do much. I'm not very smart anyway. I just take the guidance and read and see what I can see. So I was reading the energies in here when I first came in and sat down, and I could feel that there was a real good, strong emphasis on jhana, like there should be. Yet I could tell there was a lot of the bhakta here too. And I think we probably owe that to a wonderful faculty that truly cares. But the other thing that I could feel in the third chakra was a high level of fear and worry and stress in students. And this is, of course, traditional. I went through the same thing. We all go through this as we get our education. So you have a repetition compulsion. We keep getting stressed again and again. You did a good, great job on that one test. Well, how about the next one? or in one subject, but how about the other subject? 
So you see you know something about both conscious and subconscious stress. There's a lot of people nodding their head and smiling here. Now we go on to individual uh, superconscious stress. Uh, this uh, results from failure to recognize and pursue our highest personal destiny, pursuing our most noble dreams and ambitions. This is even worse than the stresses we've talked about so far, because this is where we give up hope. Now, we're not dumb. How do we get to this kind of place? It's the negative messages we, we've received. It's the challenges that we face. And sometimes we've been taught either that living out your deepest callings and longings, it's just not possible. Come on, become realistic. Get in line like everyone else. Become a cog in a wheel. Do your little part. You can have a good life, but don't go overboard. Or we'll get the message of, oh, it's out there all right, a miraculous, wonderful life. It's just not out there for you, however, because you're not good enough. So we get a lot of that. And it gets us off of truly having the courage, the heart, to go after living out our most noble hopes, dreams, and ambitions. And I am saying to you, do it anyway. Dismiss those negative things. Be positive. This is positive psychology in practice here. You can do it. You are worth it. And in fact, don't give up. You will succeed. If I succeeded, you'll succeed. Believe you me. If you knew me personally, you would say, oh, if he could do it, so can I. Now, there's something called your story related to this. That's the basic demographics of your life. Where you were born, uh, basically where you were born, your parents, uh, where you went to school, who's in your family, all these sorts of things. Uh, the basic facts. Then there is something else, the story behind the story. And this is very important. This is within all this history of where you've been, who you are. Well, who are you trying to become within your history? That's the story behind your story. That's having the courage to find, define, and live out your most noble hopes, dreams, and ambitions. When we don't do this, the stress on us is devastating. As I said, we give up hope. So I'm very strongly encouraging you to go for it. Okay. Then we come to universal superconscious stress, the stress at the level of the divine. This results from spiritual ignorance, a failure to experience our essential unity with God. Now, people try to dismiss this, because I'm telling you, this is far and away the worst kind of stress. And people say to me, yeah, 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 right, like I'm ever going to become one with God? Come on, Rick, leave me alone. It can be done, and you can do it. And this type of stress, when you don't do this and you don't seek to accomplish it, when you don't take the time every day in your life to seek and come into that oneness, because I promise you it will come if you do that. Well, when you have that oneness with the divine, you are an eternal being. When you don't have that, you are merely mortal and you die. That's the worst kind of stress. Eternal life as divine versus a little mere human life. You come around again and again on the wheel. You know, get the unity with God, please. Now, mind-body methods for dismantling uh, disease, dis-ease in the psyche and preventing or treating mental and physical illness. We found in my clinic after 35 years of doing this type of work uh, that there are four basic categories of methods that we need to use to accomplish the type of healing that we're talking about here. Uh, the first is scientific meditation. Not all methods of meditation are equal. They're just not. 
Think of what's going on when we're meditating. What's happening is the energy in the nerves, which is actually prana, from the astral body at that point is what is occupying the physical body there. The energy itself is astral energy, is being withdrawn from the peripheral nervous system up to the base of the spine at the central nervous system, going up through the chakras and up and out, and you go with it as you learn to open those chakras and move through this. So, we talk about magnetic pull. How strong is a particular meditative method in order to pull that energy back and awaken the kundalini at the base of the spine? You want methods that are strong. If you're going to spend a lot of time each day meditating, I really think you should take it out of sleep time. That's what I always did. And one night a week meditating all night long, you'll get up the next morning far more rested than if you slept, believe me. You know, you've got to have a good method if you're going to put time into it. Use those methods that have been proved scientifically to be the most effective. I teach Buddha's method of Om with the out-breath as a good general method. Then we come to clinical hypnosis. Now here in India, you're facing the same problem that we faced in the United States when you use a word like hypnosis. And people get frightened. We had to re-educate the public in the United States because people thought of hypnosis as mind control and they were frightened of it. And well, they should have been for mind control hypnosis. We all need a strong free will to go out in life and to succeed. And the religion in the United States preached against this type of hypnosis as well it should have. But modern clinical hypnosis, we almost need a totally different word, has nothing to do with mind control methods. Simply, these are ways of focusing the spotlight, the searchlight of your consciousness to more effectively achieve a purpose, whether it's an external focus that can be used, for example, in improving performance in sports or business or out in the world, or an internal focus for healing. Now, we are having so much effect, positive, uh, strong, and immediate effect from clinical hypnosis in the United States. We're using it for almost everything. I'm telling you, we've got to educate everyone here. People have to get over it. We're not talking about mind control hypnosis. This is self-directed, self-controlled by the person who is doing the hypnosis, and it brings tremendous benefit, just tremendous. Then we come to subtle energy medicine, which is scientific pranayama. And here we're using it uh, for health rather than simply for enlightenment. This was something I guess I'm credited with in the West, uh, where it just occurred to me when I had been using pranayama as part of my own spiritual practice to come to oneness. Hey, what happens if I start using it for health instead putting it into the areas of the body where disease or injury lie. And in fact, I found it was equally, equally as effective for health as it was for spiritual enlightenment. And then we come to cognitive reprogramming, a form of psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is for everyone. This is another stigma area that we had to work through in the United States that you'll be, you know, you're starting to work through here now. Uh, the idea that psychotherapy, or if you see a psychologist, that means you're crazy, you're mentally ill. Well, people who are mentally ill certainly need to see a psychologist, but we all need this type of treatment. Because everyone in living a life, we all end up with distorted thoughts and feelings which compromise our mental health and ultimately our physical health. Uh, the type of psychotherapy that has scientifically been validated as most effective in the last 30 years is cognitive therapy, also called cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and probably the most powerful tool out of it is cognitive reprogramming. Uh, and I have created a seven-step method uh, that when you follow seven steps, uh, because what happens is your negative emotions are created by distortions in your thinking. 
Your feelings do not arise in and of themselves. They are a result of your thoughts. Positive thoughts, positive feelings. But when you have chronic negative emotions in you, you know that there is significant distortion in your thinking. When you reprogram this out, like the method that I have, uh, you will get rid of chronic negative emotions that have haunted you for years. You'll get rid of them in three to four weeks. I'm not exaggerating. This is something you do on yourself. This is all self-empowerment. So let's look at each of these a little bit. I'll try to move along as well as I can time-wise here. Scientific meditation is truly a gift from the gods. And these are the documented, scientific, scientifically validated benefits that we have from meditation. And look at them, you know. They bring in the uh, human relaxation response. They improve immune system functioning. Uh, lower blood pressure. Reduce plaque in the arteries. Uh, achieve freedom from chronic pain. People come to me who have years of chronic pain and we get rid of it in a matter of weeks, typically. And shorten recovery time from surgery and medical procedures. Uh, very often, we eliminate the need for surgery to begin with. But if the surgery is still needed when you use some of these mind-body methods before and after surgery, uh, typically only 45 minutes to an hour each time, uh, uh, what happens is uh, that we cut inpatient length of stay in half and post-op medications to a quarter to a third is about typical. And what's happened with my patients around Washington, D.C. is that they often come back and tease me because their doctors, their surgeons afterward, uh, when they see them say, did you go see Dr. Levy before coming in here? because the difference in recovery time is so stark. It's such a difference. Uh, all of these good, feel-good chemicals, the endorphins that bring happiness and also promote health, lowering anxiety and depression, these are the two main symptoms of stress. Now, I'm addressing an audience of college students, university students. You know about anxiety. You know about depression. How am I going to tell my parents about the grade I just got? I am so depressed. Can I run away? Oh, no, that'll be worse. Yeah. We knock these things off with these methods so that you're back in shape to go to study and take the next test. Ah, you need clear thinking. And then you get to the spiritual benefits. It expands the intuitive insight uh, that comes through soul consciousness. Uh, you're going to do better academically <laughs> that way anyway, though it might be cheating. You've got to study and learn anyway. Uh, and it provides us access to that infinite power of the universal superconscious mind, the divine. So, why don't people meditate? Here I kind of get on a soapbox. I can become a little too preachy sometimes. I'll try not to. People say, well, I just don't have the time. I'm very busy. Well, I work at least 80 hours a week, sometimes 100, and I still meditate uh, three to four hours a day. I take it out of sleep. If you don't have the time to meditate, you do. What happens is when you do meditate, it's going to add on eight to 10 years to your life anyway. If you want time, meditate. Where people think meditation is for swamis, gurus, sadhus, you know, but not for me, you know. It's this old thing of, do you have to pick a worldly life or a spiritual life? And what you will see as I talk in just a, a little bit further here uh, is you don't have to make that choice anymore. You can now have both. Or, and I hear this a lot from the youth of India. I remember being interviewed by a, a young lady for the Times of India. Dr. Levy, my generation, we're worried that if we meditate, 
we are going to lose our zeal for worldly achievement. I tell you, that's nonsense. You achieve far better from joy and fulfillment than you do from fear and anxiety. If you want to do better in your worldly achievement, meditate. Or people maybe use a method that doesn't deliver results. Now that can be a valid thing there with what I said before. Use those scientifically validated methods that really have the magnetic pull to draw in the energy. Then the last one, people try meditation, they get frustrated and give up. It's bad enough going through life with all the constant shifting of attention we have to do, going from here to there. Uh, but when we sit down to meditate, oh, I'm going to come into peace. I, I heard Dr. Levy, I know, I can do it, I can do it. I'm coming into peace, love, joy. And what do you find? Monkey mind. Your mind is hopping all over here, there. It's driving you crazy. And then you conclude, I can't do this. Maybe it just doesn't work for me, or I'm not good at this. Now, any experienced meditator, as I've said, it's 41 years I've lived the life of a silent yogi. Uh, you, we all know that we went through one to two years of, I dare say, mental torture. It drove us crazy at the beginning like that, but we would not give up. Uh, this is why I created something called hypnotic meditation. This has become well known in the West now, particularly in the United States, and has become uh, well accepted. Uh, I found that if I took people into a particular hypnotic induction available to you for free on the web, you'll see how that melts people into white light, and then you meditate, hypnotic meditation, what happens is body and mind are immediately deeply relaxed and you kick right into the benefits of meditation without having that one or two year period which is so difficult. My own case being a little slow, it took me about two and a half years before it kicked in. You don't have to suffer like that. The other thing we find when you combine these together is they not only speed the process of healing dramatically, but that enlightenment process. You know, if you pick the spiritual life traditionally here, you knew you were looking at 30 to 40 years of this to come into Sabakalpa. And that's the choice you made in life. Well, we have found uh, that we have routinely now, I know I'm making a big statement, we have routinely cut this time down to two to five years. The other day I brought someone into Sabakalpa and, ba and Baba Mukta in three months. This is not because I have any particular merit. It's because it's something that God wants at this point. Because the world has now gotten very small. And we can't live in the old ways that we used to of conflict with each other. And so now, for example, if we go to war, you are probably bombing either your supplier or your market. The old ways don't work anymore. The world is now extremely small. And we have to have people who are outrunning the world now who are enlightened. You look at uh, Gandhiji. And you will see that he will become a model followed all over the world, and not only by the presidents uh, and leaders of the countries, but people who are heading up different companies, universities, NGOs, and directors of different departments. We require now that being in the world, we have to have leaders who are enlightened. So I'm looking at you folks because I'm looking at the future of India right here in front of me. Part of your responsibility is to learn your field that you're being trained for. But I'm telling you part of your responsibility that is now absolutely a necessity is to come into enlightenment. And do not view this as something that someone else can do. Oh, Swami Biyandananda. Oh, he can do it, but not me. 
Not so. The times are changing, and this is something available to each and every one of us, and you should pursue it with single-minded purpose. All right, I'll get off my soapbox now. I warned you, that's a dangerous one for me. Now, let us come to clinical hypnosis. Clinical hypnosis was approved by the American Medical Association in 1954 as a mainstream medical intervention, so it's already 55 years old. The stigma attached to hypnosis is pretty well gone in the United States now, and this will have to happen in India, I think, also. It is simply a state of highly focused attention or concentration. Uh, and its benefits are gigantic. It lets us release and resolve negative thoughts and emotions that are related to uh, our historic stress. It lets us dismantle subconscious repetition compulsions, the patterns we keep living over and over that can uh, really be demolishing our life. Uh, a simple example of that a girl grows up with a distant father emotionally, or maybe he travels a lot. So he's only partially available. She becomes a people pleaser. And every boyfriend that she has that she attracts to her is also a man who is only partially available. And she marries a man who is only partially available and either lives a very unfulfilling marriage or may get divorced. Uh, which is extremely traumatic to have to go through. And then if she doesn't get treatment for this, she's only going to repeat the same pattern anyway. So we're not just talking theory here. We're talking about the things that have dramatic impact on our lives and our well-being. Clinical hypnosis through hypnotic regression work and hypnotic affirmation is extremely effective, as well as the hypnotic meditation helps on this. Also, modifying negative behaviors, overeating, smoking. So if you add on 8 to 10 years through meditation, but then you're smoking and you die young from cancer, that wasn't such a good plan. And the clinical hypnosis unleashes vast power to achieve your various objectives. One of the methods that I have not only lets you bring about health, but also tremendous well-being in the world, uh, by, uh, could we have a little quiet there, please? As those of you who have to file out, please keep your voices down as you do so. Thank you. Uh, one of the methods lets you uh, move energy to draw into your life the ideal circumstances that you want, the job you want, the partner in, in life, the spouse you want, the good friends, all the well-being, uh, you can get partly th your, through your activity out into the world, but you also can get it through moving the prana, the energy that is underlying all of the creation of uh, the Mayak world, and draw to you energetically, far more powerfully, the things that you want than even your worldly activities might make them happen for you. Then we come to cognitive reprogramming. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we come to subtle energy medicine. Uh, we are not just biochemical beings. We are biophysical beings. The chemicals that comprise the body and uh, govern bodily processes are made of subatomic energy. Trace it all the way down from the body to the organs, to the cells, to the atoms the molecules to the atoms, to the atomic parts, to the subatomic parts like the quarks, and back behind that what you find is that quantum field of energy. That's what we are made out of just as the wave arises from the ocean. At that quantum level this energy is sometimes called prana, chi, subtle energy, and it is governed by thought. But I don't mean thought, you know that popular book, The Secret? It's still on a bestseller list here. So people said, ah, I get what I think. Okay, fine. I'm rich. And then they weren't rich. Or I'm healthy, but they weren't all better. And then they got despondent or angry. This isn't true. Well, 
It's not just thought at the level of conscious mind. It's thought at all four levels of mind. And when you learn to think and control energy at all four levels of mind, uh, you can manifest anything you want because you have merged in and are one with the divine. It can be used to heal body. It can be used to heal mind. It can be used to create vast extravagant levels of well-being uh, and of course the most important thing the only true purpose it leads you right into oneness with God the purpose of life itself now we come to cognitive reprogramming the single greatest psychological cause of heart disease and any other type of disease is unresolved grief, fear, anger, shame, other negative emotions. Uh, now, feeling follows thought. If a person is suffering from chronic ill feeling, as I said before, by definition, their thinking is distorted, correct the distorted thinking, and the chronic negative emotions will disappear. Again, it sounds fine in theory, but I'm talking about you and me and the fact that we go through in our life uh, often plagued by very harmful negative emotions that rob us of joy and fulfillment and you think there's nothing you can do to get rid of these things because you've tried so many things I am telling you that in three to four weeks they will be gone with these methods that I uh, have put together summarizing the field so what difference does this all make? When used as a lifestyle choice, mind-body methods can prevent the onset of mental and physical illness, even in people who have a genetic predisposition. Loads of studies on this. It's not that you're doomed toward having this disease or mental illness. You can get rid of it, that it won't even come to you. Now, for those who have already been diagnosed, Mind-body methods combined with conventional care will reduce all the kind of things you'd want to see. Reduce the need for surgery and procedures. Reduce dependency on medication. Within the mental health arena, if you know anything from the medication side of this, the medications still are symptomatically based. We're only getting into a decent level of molecular biology now. I'm one of the people helping move that forward. I do like the physical aspect of treatment also in this. Uh, but those, the old medications that exist, they fog you up. They get in the way. You don't want to be on those unless you have to anyway. And then all these other benefits that come. There's just really some of the things that I have to mention also are reversing or eradicating symptoms of disease that are supposed to kill you. Again, two out of three people that come to me with a terminal diagnosis, we're getting them into remission. They're going on living for years and they're fine. Regenerating dead or diseased tissues, knocking out cancer. There's the mass. It's right there on the pictures. And then they do the work and now the mass is gone. The surgery isn't even needed. We are seeing this routinely, not rarely. We are seeing this routinely. So, we are getting results that bring vast improvement in treatment outcomes for all of the big physical illnesses, the big five as they're called, heart disease, stroke, cancer, respiratory illness, diabetes, the things that have devastated life. We are now being able to eradicate, not simply through a pill, not simply through a surgical procedure, but through the power of your own mind and soul. And as you come into oneness with God and pursue that, you eliminate the chances of getting any of these along the way. And someone who has them already can knock them right off and get better dramatically. Not just a little bit of result, a dramatic result. There is something called... Uh, the sixth, oh, that's okay. you can leave it there. There's something called uh, the 60-40 split. Uh, 
in conventional health care, for example, on physical problems, but same applies with mental health too. If you're using the traditional health care, and you should, I'm no radical here, use what we know from the past, uh, that will give you uh, Ah, that will give you 40% of your health care outcome. But when you add in good mind-body methods using mentalistic and spiritual means, you get 150% more effect. That's a gigantic amount. My cousin was the head of one of the big phar pharmaceutical companies. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars on drugs if they would give about a 3% improvement. We are bringing about routinely a 150% effect increase. That is an unbelievable number so that people sometimes look at me and think I'm lying until they see the work for themselves. So we are in fact moving into a golden age. We are in fact very fortunate to be alive now because we can turn the world on its ear with the vast power that God is bringing to us. And it's not something external to you, it is right within you. And whether it's physical or whether it's all the forms of mental illness, the depression, the anxiety, uh, the more serious mental health problems, the same thing applies. What difference does it make? Further, state of the art, Science-based mind-body methods can result in a complete and permanent cure even when conventional medicine has little or no effect. There is a heart disease called long QT uh, that has an abnormal uh, EKG uh, and it is a 100% sure killer and there is no treatment for it. They can implant a defibrillator to try to bring you back uh, if you have this and you go into one of these attacks and that's all they can do. We cure it now with these methods. We are routinely unblocking arteries. Just the other day an elderly lady uh, who needed um, uh, double bypass open heart surgery and she was expected to die on the table uh, but they had to try and by using these methods, I did remote pranayama on her. She's not open to doing anything herself. I did the work at a distance on her from one end of the city to another, mentalistically sending this healing energy in, unblocked one artery, and the other artery that was too weak for surgery strengthened it. So they were able to go in through uh, an angiogram where they cut the person at the groin and go up the femoral artery into the carotid artery and into the heart and just rotor rooter out with a little blade, little blade, that one remaining blocked artery, and stitched her up the next day, sent her home, she's fine. These are the kind of things. Congestive heart failure also has no good treatment methods conventionally. We're knocking this stuff, stuff off easily. And if you'll allow me a very poor joke here, Diabetes is merely a piece of cake. So, here's what's happened. Over 35 years of doing this type of work in my clinic, treating people from all around the world, I reached the conclusion I couldn't see the whole world in that clinic. It just wasn't big enough. I didn't have enough time. So we started exploring out into the role of media. And with this book, uh, Miraculous Health, but I will uh, leave a copy for your library. Also, I have some CDs just to give away to some of the students with some of the methods on them, but also a website that you'll see in a minute. What we found we could do was very interesting. It shows no one's necessary. We're eliminating me from the picture here. You, you go to this particular website, uh, and it explains things to you. Uh, and then it takes you through a self-assessment process uh, that shows you why you have the problems you need or that you have from a mind-body uh, spirit perspective. Uh, it prescribes particular methods to use and when to use them. These methods are, <coughs> excuse me, these methods are my voice leading you through these protocols exactly as if you were in the clinic with me. 
It's a virtual clinic, in other words. Now, it's almost as easy as taking a pill. Think of it. You take a pill, hey, that's all you got to do. This isn't quite that easy, but all you do is download these protocols and you lay back on a bed or a couch or a recliner and just listen. It's relaxing, it's easy, it's fun. People, when they get better, sometimes keep using the methods because they like them for fun. It feels so good and you get all better and in the process you get this little side benefit uh, called coming into enlightenment. So and we also have a very liberal copyright so you go to these methods and you download them and you burn them on CD or MP3 well make some copies for your friends because we are in this work simply to serve the people uh, my wife and partner in this work and myself, uh, neither one of us was very good at living a life for self. It was too boring to begin with. And we chose long ago simply to live a life for God and to serve. So our only interest is getting out to those who are in need, that which will heal them and help them come into the absolute healing the oneness in the divine. So use these methods and change your life. Thank you for having me here today. It's been a pleasure. Pragya TV has been gracious enough to back up the schedule a little bit where I'm supposed to go to film a, an interview show to give me about 10 minutes time to just let you experience a little induction here. Uh, what I will do is take you into a shortened version of the uh, hypnotic meditation induction. Uh, we won't have time to do a full-blown thing here, but I just want you to get a little taste of it. Now, if you do not know a method of meditation, then the simplest one that I teach is Buddha's method, what you'll do is you'll simply, with eyes closed, allow the breath to go in and out on its own. You don't try to control it. You let the body control the rate of breathing. And then for the length of the out-breath, simply say to yourself the sound OM. Mentally, not out loud, OM. For the length of the out-breath. Now, when you do this for a little while, what happens is you drift off into a thought, feeling, memory, daydream, something. You try to catch that as soon as it happens, and then you let go of it and come right back to the method, OM, with the out-breath. What I will do now is take you into this short induction, and then we will meditate simply for about two minutes so you get the hang of it and then I will bring you back out from the hypnosis. So, anyone who has to leave, now is the time to do it before the induction, but I hope that I have tantalized you enough with the possibilities that you might indulge me with a few more minutes of your presence. And if you invite me back in the future, I will harass you again with the spiritual message. All right, get comfortable. You want back, neck, and head reasonably aligned, but you don't need a, a fancy formal meditation posture. And of course, cell phones need to be off, obviously, in something like this. And then let the eyes close. If you wish, you can focus the gaze at the ajna. Up to you. If you would, please. Just draw in a deep breath for a moment. Hold that breath. Let the breath go. Let the eyes be closed. Just let yourself collapse back and relax a bit. Let go of any tension that may be in the body. Simply on purpose, let the whole body go loose, limp, and relaxed. 
Let the feet and the legs go. Let the torso go. Let the hands and the arms go. Let the neck and the head go. Loose, limp, and relaxed. And as I count backwards from ten down to one, let the lulling tone of my voice and the energy flowing through it just ease you down deeper and deeper relaxed. Ten down, down, down. Nine deeper, deeper, deeper. Eight down, down, down. Seven deeper, deeper, deeper. Six down, down, down. Five deeper, deeper, deeper. Four down, down, down. Three. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Two down, down, down. One deeper, deeper, deeper. Sinking way down, way down, way down in a nice peaceful feeling and drifting off into a relaxing hypnotic sleep. Imagining now that a little bit above the head, perhaps a meter and wider than the shoulders, is a ball of pure white spiritual light filled with peace, healing, joy, and love. As the white light gently begins to flow down through the head and the neck, filling every cell of the body with white light as the white light passes <clears throat> with peace, healing, joy and love as the white light flows out through the shoulders and down both arms through the hands through the chest and the upper part of the back through the stomach and the lower part of the back and down to the waist. Every cell of the body as the white light passes being filled with pure white light, pure pure Peace, healing, joy, and love. 
as the white light glows down through the lower part of the stomach, the hips, the buttocks, and down both legs through the thighs and the knees. Every cell of the body being filled with white light, with peace, healing, joy, and love. As the white light flows down, through the calves, the ankles, and the feet, so that from head to toe, the entire body is filled with pure white light, pure peace, healing, joy and love. As the breath flows in and out on its own, with the in-breath bringing in ever new fresh white light into you, ever new fresh peace, healing, joy, and love. And the out-breath brings white light from inside of you to all that is around you, so that as far as you can imagine, in every direction is only pure white light, pure peace, healing, joy and love and the outline of the body becomes a mere formality white light on the inside white light on the outside all is peace, healing, joy, and love. As the outline of the body melts back into the white light, so that all that there is is pure white light, pure peace, healing, joy, and love. Now just gently meditate for the next minute or two until I speak again.
now let this very brief meditation come to completion while remaining with eyes closed in this nice relaxing hypnotic sleep. And as I count from one up to five, on the count of five, allow the eyes to open as you return, feeling good. One, two, three, four, Five, letting the eyes open and feeling fine. Now that's just a little taste, not quite the real thing, but enough to give you a little of the flavor. And please just go to powertoheelit.com and download the real thing. Thank you, it's been a great pleasure. I'm